Welcome to tonight's panel on personalities in post-war publishing. Um, I'm Carla Nielsen, and I'm the curator of literature here in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia, and in charge of our many publishers' archives, which are a uh, strength of the collection and um, really distinguishing feature of the collection. Um, it goes back to the 19th century with the papers of Harper's and Brother Harper and Brothers, which later became um, Harper and Row, and is now Harper Collins, and includes smaller independent publishers such as the Culture Press and the Dalkey Archive in addition to our mammothly large collections like Random House and Harper's, um, and the papers of Richard Leo Simon and Max Lincoln Schuster. Um, publishers create the conditions in which ideas can appear in the, quote, marketplace of ideas, and the role of independent publishers, such as the three at for discussion tonight, become even more important as other channels of communication become more commercialized and uniform. Barney Rossett, Samuel Roth, and Roger Strauss all ran presses that ran against the grain um, of conventional publishing and expanded the range of ideas that could be thought, discussed, and debated. Um, I wanted to dedicate tonight's panel to Andre Schifrin, who passed away on December 1st at the age of 78. Uh, for many years, Schifrin was a formidable editor at the Pantheon Press and then went on to found uh, the nonprofit New Press. Um, and also, I want to take this opportunity to announce that 70 boxes from the New Press are arriving here tomorrow. Um, and we're very happy to be working with them and adding that very distinguished independent publisher to the collection in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Uh, many of the personalities up for discussion tonight had some connection to Columbia. Samuel Roth attended Columbia for about a year and a half in 1917, 1918. Uh, he took charge of a literary journal here called The Lyric and took it off campus with him when he dropped out. Um, Roger Strauss Jr. did not attend Columbia, but both his father and his son did. Um, and, and Robert Giroux. Oh, what? Robert Giroux. Oh, yeah. Um, and we did some uh, collect a 1,200 page, did you say, Boris? 1,200 page oral history from um, Roger Strauss Jr. And then, of course, Robert Giroux attended, uh, graduated from Columbia College in the 1930s. Um, when here, he worked for the Columbia Review and met two friends who he would later publish at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Thomas, Martin and, uh, Thomas Merton and John Berryman. Um, Barney Rossett's connection to Columbia began very late in his life when he sold us his papers about seven years ago. I'm very pleased to welcome these three panelists to campus, or rather back to campus. Um, they have all drawn on our collections for their research, and after their 2013 books on Samuel Roth, Ross, uh, the Grove Press and the Evergreen Review, and Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, the field of study has been opened for more work on independent publishing in the 20th century. Um, their books were for sale before the talk, um, the panel, and will be again afterwards, and I want to thank Book Culture for bringing those books here for sale. Uh, the moderator for tonight's panel, Lauren Glass, will introduce himself and the other panelists, but I wanted to let you know really quickly about a few related events um, that you might also want to attend. Uh, tomorrow night, Lauren uh, will be moderating a panel featuring former Grove Press employees at Syracuse University's Lubin House at 11 East 61st Street. Um, that begins at 7 p.m. Um, also, in the Pallets Gallery at Lubin House is an excellent ex exhibition, Strange Victories, Grove Press, 1951 to 1985. Um, the full exhibit went up at Syracuse University Library in January of this year and was curated by Lucy Mulroney and Susan Klein. Um, these exhibitions celebrate the opening of the Grove Press Archive at Syracuse University, um, which is wonderful because that was a big undertaking. Um, there will also be an exhibition on Samuel Roth upstairs in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library um, from January through May of next year. Uh, that opens on January 21st with a talk by Joyce and copyright expert Robert Spoo. Um, I will announce the details for that event to our mailing list, so if you are interested in it and not already on it, please sign up afterwards. And now I want to turn the panel over to Lauren Bess. Thank you so much, Carla, um, uh, for arranging this and for collecting all of the useful material that we have all been able to benefit from to create this work. Um, publishers uh, have traditionally been a sort of missing link in literary history and literary criticism, and I'm proud to be able to join these folks in, uh, to a certain degree, correcting for that neglect and telling some of the stories of the folks who didn't write the books but brought us the books that we read, although with Sam Roth, that's a little more complicated. He wrote them. <laughs> um, as well. So uh, I'm here to 
just to introduce the panelists, including myself, who will each speak for about 15 minutes about our individual figure. Um, we came up with the idea for this panel um, partly for alliterative reasons. Publishers and you know per personalities in post-war publishing seemed nice, but um, but also because uh, it was an era, roughly speaking, in in which there um, were publishers, uh, you know, before the sort of incorporation of publishing, which frequently were associated with the personalities of their founders, and so this is partly meant to um, dwell a little bit on uh, the significance of this particular moment in the history of American publishing. Um, so the speakers, and we're going to speak um, actually in the order of the um, the careers that we are tracking here, right? So our first uh, speaker, Jay Gertzman, uh, is Professor Emeritus of English at Mansfield University. Um, in 1999, he published Book Leggers and Smut Hounds, The Trade in Erotica, 1920 to 1940, with the University of Pennsylvania Press, so an enormously useful and wonderful book. Um, his now more recent biography, Samuel Roth, Infamous Modernist, was a natural outgrowth of that book due to topics he studied regarding publishers, distributors, outlets, booksellers, and clientele. Um, and he also wants to say he could not have studied Roth without the splendid archive at Columbia and also the staff at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. He is also grateful to the Roth grandchildren for permitting him access to these materials. To my further left, Boris Kochka is the author of Hot House, The Art of Survival and the Survival of Art at America's Most Celebrated Publishing House. As a longtime contributing editor to New York Magazine, Kachka has written and edited pieces on literature, publishing, and theater for more than a decade, including in-depth profiles of Joan Didion, Toni Morrison, Tom Wolfe, and Thomas Pynchon, as well as interviews with hundreds of cultural figures across the arts. He's also written about culture and travel for Condé Nast Traveler, GQL, The New York Times, and other publications, and contributed to the anthology Made in Russia, Unsung Icons of Soviet Design. He too graduated from Columbia University with a bachelor's degree in English and a master's in journalism. Born in the Soviet Union, he was raised in Brooklyn, where he lives today with his wife and son. And now I will quasi-narcissistically introduce myself. I am Lauren Glass. I'm an uh, associate professor of English at the University of Iowa. My first book was called Authors, Inc., Literary Celebrity in the Modern United States. It was published by New York University Press in 2004. And my most recent book, um, which I'm hawking here today, uh, published in the Post 45 series with Stanford University Press is called Grove Press, The Evergreen Review, and the Incorporation of the Avant-Garde. Um, and I didn't attend Columbia, but both my parents did, and indeed they met here. So um, I owe my life to this <laughs> institution. <laughs> um, so Jay, you're up first, and you wanted to take uh, okay, here. Um, I wanted to... Uh, yeah, hand out something that has some of the books that were published on it. Roth is uh, pretty much known as a villain and as a pirate. Um, and uh, I wanted to point out that uh, these books are in some way or another significant and um, not possibly what you expect. Um, because he often had a very good knowledge of literature, of modernism, but also of classical literature. One of his favorite. Uh, writers of Voltaire, uh, and he published a edition of Voltaire with no one lost. Too close. <laughs> Too close to a um, review uh, of the review or a, um, yes, <coughs> a criticism that Vanity Fair ran of Sam Roth in 1932 telling their readers that he was nominated for oblivion because of his expurgated edition of Lady Chapley's Lover. Anyhow, okay, this is the first, my first sli uh, slide. And um, this is, it, Roth is on uh, your right. As a 10-year-old boy, most, peop most uh, immigrant families in Lower East Side had their portrait, had their photographs made soon after their arrival to send to the people back home. Uh, and Carla mentioned the lyric, which he published with the man who got him into Columbia, his roommate Frank Tannenbaum, a great activist uh, and a friend of Emmett Goldman. Um, and even the New York Times said that the, this book, or this uh, little magazine, was one of the best efforts from a college campus. This um, is Samuel Roth in church sleeves, 1920. He would be on uh, your right, the tall one. 
he, he founded a bookstore in 1920. He only had it for about a year. But he met many writers and uh, poets there. And um, he had a strange but typical Rothian uh, tactic. He read the books, and he either liked them or he, they, or he didn't. And if he didn't like them, he had a placard made that he wrote up himself telling people why they should not like this book. Uh, it was not a bad way to sell books. He said those placards were um, the reason for the unpopularity of his business. But meanwhile, he was writing good poetry himself. He had poems, a couple of poems, published in a poetry magazine in 1920. And by 1925, he had published two well-reviewed books. And yet, he was broke. Uh, his bookstore went bankrupt. And eventually, he left to uh, the country for six months or so. And he met a lot of writers in England. Um, he was an unpaid correspondent, but uh, when he got back, he had a lot of contacts. He had communicated in writing with Pound and Joyce. He hadn't met them. When he got back, he was broke and very thin because he didn't eat very well in England. But one of the things he did, and he was very resourceful, he founded a school for immigrants teaching them English. Uh, several of uh, Louis Zukovsky, for instance, the poet taught there, so did Charles Reznikov. Anyway, he recouped his finances, and he started what he called the magazine empire, at least an incipient magazine empire. These four, um, the, all four of his magazines are in this full-page advertisement in the Saturday Review, 1926. Two Worlds was a, a subscription magazine, which was fully subscribed because he was very good at interesting people. In his, uh, in his magazines. He was a, he's great at writing advertising copy. Uh, Two Worlds, I underlined and read some of his own pseudonyms, because naturally he published a lot of his own stuff in there. Uh, and he published, uh, he called it a new unnamed work, that is, uh, work in progress. It finally became, of course, um, Finnegan's Wake. Um, he did pay for the first four episodes of Finnegan's Wake. Uh, works in progress, although that was denied a little later by Joyce and his friends. Um, Bo was uh, actually a man's magazine, as he says, a little bit before Esquire, and really foreshadowed Esquire in various <coughs> ways. Um, Casanova Jr.'s Tales, well, Bo was a newsstand magazine. It, along with Two Worlds Monthly, another newsstand magazine, broke him. Two Worlds Monthly had the installments of Ulysses in it. Um, 12 of them all together, not uh, authorized by Joyce. Roth said that he had, his, he had Pound's permission, but, um, and Pound was Joyce's agent at the time, but he could never produce the letter that said that. Casanova Jr.'s Tales was the second um, subscription magazine, and I point out there something called My First 30 Years by Gertrude Beasley, which is a a autobiography of her West Texas upbringing. It was very frank. It had descriptions of uh, bestiality uh, in it, as well as other um, kinds of sexual activity. H.L. Mencken loved the book, but said it could never be published in America. That's why it came, Joyce Pub uh, Broth published it. Now, this is uh, the fifth installment of, of uh, work in progress. Joyce definitely took the money for the first four installments, but when he saw this one, he decided he did not want Roth to be his publisher in America. And until then, Roth had a hope that it, that would happen. As you can see, it was because um, that erotic illustration had nothing to do with work in progress, nothing to do with the text, and that's the last thing that Joyce needed, was to be thought of as an erotic uh, writer. Okay, now I get to something that's very interesting, I think, and important. This is the first of his, uh, mag his, his uh, little mag it was a little magazine. Um, and what I wanted to point out was the colophon. Uh, of course, books, attractive books, and uh, books that cost a lot of money had colophons, um, illustrations of some sort. Uh, and Roth's had a similar, a one rather similar to others. These are Greek figures, and they are sporting with each other in a way that Greek and, and Latin that is, uh, classical figures are allowed to do without them being censored in a way that modern figures would not be. But what I wanted to point out was the, um, 
the legend here, published every three months at the side of the Monte Grease Ball. Now, that's typical of Roth. Uh, in his school for teaching immigrants English, the two people, the two um, uh, immigrant groups would be the Italian and the um, Jewish, and this was on the Lower East Side. Monte is a word that means a Jew who's come to the country and has a uh, Eastern European accent. And Grisball refers to an Italian. When Ross Registrar would, uh, uh, Roth applicant would come to the um, place where he would sign up and get in some information about what the school was like, he had a, Roth had a registrar. And that registrar, when a man decided not to sign up and he was Jewish, he would call him under his breath a Maki. And when that named Italian, he would call him under his breath a Grisball. This is not Roth, it's his registrar. But Roth's putting that into his color fund is an example of him trying to make himself not only a publisher, not only a publisher, uh, a gentlemanly publisher who sold erotic literature and modernism, but his own, uh, per, he was his own person as a rather vulgar East Side Jew with his own personal identity, which he would not give up. The same thing happened when he went, came back from Italy, from, from London, he would use there, when he was there, uh, the word putz and schmuck a lot when he was talking about London writers. It was something that he did actually uh, purposely because he had his own identity, which he insisted was different from those of the other gentlemen writers and men of letters which he of which he wanted to be one. Okay, that's um, something that's important and to um, state. And uh, the next slide that I have <clears throat> tells you something about how sly and also how deceptive Roth was. This is a flyer for Ulysses that, uh, that he published, unauthorized, in Two Worlds Monthly, expurgated as well, which Joyce would never have allowed. Um, and if you notice, if you don't look at this carefully, it looks as if Ulysses appeared in 12 installments in 12 issues of Two Worlds Monthly, the most daring and most brilliant book of our time. But it sounds like it's a whole book, which of course it was not. Um, he also says, along, uh, that along with all these other things, you don't even know if they're by choice or not, but he, ab he advocates them as the gayest the most astonishing reading obtainable, which of course means the most sexually explicit reading obtainable that you could possibly have, which of course is untrue, that it was expurgated. Uh, complete in two beautifully bound and boxed volumes might look a little bit as if it's actually um, Ulysses. Well, it isn't. It's the, uh, it's the uh, run of Two Worlds Monthly that's uh, bound and boxed and so forth. Okay, now, um, I'm moving on now since Roth was an outcast from the profession because of this international protest against Two Worlds Monthly. And I want to move on quickly. His career as a man of letters was over. He was thought of as a thief and a pirate, although there was no international copyright agreement at the time. And so a, a, a publisher in America did not have to pay a, publish, a, a writer from England but they usually did because they did not want to cheat that English writer. Roth, in, doing, in ignoring this concept, this idea of what they call trade courtesy, was doing something that was really rather evil. And that's why he was called a thief and a pirate, although it's important to note that Roth's doing this was one real reason, important reason, for Joyce getting enough sympathy to actually get his uh, Ulysses published by Random House in 1934. But uh, I, uh, I'd also point out that in, in the international protests and in the storm of criticism of Roth, they were ver quite untruthful about in various aspects, both calling him a pirate, but especially in saying that he had not paid for the excerpts in, of uh, the work in progress, which he clearly had. Roth then turned to publishing pornography um, to support his family. He spent 1936, 1939 in prison. And when he came back, he started a career of publishing false erotica or um, uh, borderline material by mail order. And that uh, lasted from 1940 to 1957. And this was really his greatest 
uh, contribution to freedom of expression. And um, I'd like to uh, point out also that these two images, which are circular, they sent to very many people. Uh, I don't know how much you can read about this, but what Roth modeled his business on was sending the concept of sending to the hinterlands, to men who, were, who lived in rural areas, the kind of materials that you could find in, in Times Square bookstores in the 1940s and 50s. That's why on the, uh, on your, um, the upper uh, left, you have, I didn't get it all in, violence in the handling of women, sadomasochism. Next to that, the love affairs between adolescents and children, um, pedophilia. The Law of Paris at Night and three books about wanton women are books about uh, prostitution. Um, this one is even more uh, risible if you want to think of it that way, um, hermaphroditism. These books sold very well and uh, they, um, they, they, they got him quite a lot of money. Now in 1947, Roth published this novel, which he actually wrote in prison. It was about a man named Bummerap, an Italian in immigrant who had been arrested for demonstrating in favor of a communist, rab a communist revolution, as he called it. Uh, he fell in uh, with a group of people, including a, a wealthy Fifth Avenue aristocrat with a beautiful daughter. And this, the post office ordered a, a fraud order against this advertisement for that book because when Roth wrote this book, he advertised, as you see here, as a book that you could read about the, um, the male, a male's first sexual contact with a woman. Bummerap was the title, and the subtitle was The Story of a Male Virgin. <clears throat> so you have here something that makes you think that you're going to read the whole thing, that this is real pornography. The Passion of Male Innocence. I underline the reverberations are both loud and colorful. Uh, I underlined in the next paragraph, until he reaches love's secret and sacred precinct. And then, of course, at the end of the first spasm. The point is that one chapter of this book ended, uh, began, uh, chapter ended, I should say, with Bummerap kissing a certain countess's toes. And the next chapter began the next morning. So there was nothing in this book about what he's advertising. Um, you must be there in person. It is a scene you would pay a great deal to see. The book sweeps you into it as if you were already there. And that also indicates that you read the whole thing. And of course, none of that could be so. Because if it was, the post office would have declared the book unmailable for obscenity. As it was, they declared it unmailable also, but in this case, for, um, for fraud. And that linkage between fraud and obscenity is a very important one, and it one that led, actually, um, to what Barney Ross said and his brilliant lawyers had to contend with uh, in 1959. It was very easy to, to um, censor a book, or uh, yes, a book or an advertisement for, for fraud, because it was obviously fraud if you were going to advertise, for instance, that this or that um, formula could restore your, bulk, your hair or your lost manhood, to, for instance. It was much harder to specify what obscenity was. It, it had to do with the mores of the present time, for instance, and many other subjective things. And so these two, were, these two uh, concepts were equally important to the post office uh, in censoring material through the mails, both fraud and obscenity, and they loved to mix them up because one was uh, clear and, and obvious and the other obscenity was not. And they, could all, they also worked on the uh, premise that something that was obscene was naturally fraud because you couldn't send it through the mails if it was really obscene. It's kind of circular reasoning, but that's how they operated. This, um, point, this is an important case, uh, which is Roth v. Goldman, 1947. It's an appellate case in which Roth argued that due to a mail block, he had received no orders for five books that he had sent out. He said, this is restraint of trade. And the post office said, we declared these books unmailable because we thought that if they got through the mails, that before we were able, if we allowed them through the mails, before we were able to have a hearing and understand what was in them, 
um, all the uh, sending or the fraud in these books would be out for people to be fooled by. The trouble with that was that the post office hearings were ex parte, that is, they weren't adversarial procedures at all. In fact, the post, they would, declare, they, they would um, hold a hearing, they would give the evidence from the postal inspector, and the uh, hearing judge would always say, you're right, this book is obscene. So that, in fact, is a, not only is it an improper procedure, but is clearly restraint of trade. That's what it amounts to. And in this case, Roth tried to fight this, and he was told the review should not be overly extensive when obviously a person is trying to make money through prurience, which is a cure, what it can be defined as, uh, well, a shameful curiosity. Now, um, one judge in, said that this was not fair for this particular book. And um, well, I, I don't want to go, OK. This, this particular book called Waggish Tales from the Czechs, because he said there was no clear and present danger in this set of 96 stories, which were smoking room stories that were not obscene in any way, in order for this book to suffer from a restraint of trade or to suffer from not being allowed through the mails. Um, that was another um, a development and a, a, a development that was in favor of a greater a greater regulate, a greater freedom for mail order booksellers. Um, that you couldn't really say that there was a clear and present danger involved in such a um, in such a restriction or an unmailability ruling. That also was very important uh, when Barney Rossett came to uh, make his case in 1959. In 1955, Roth was called before the Kafora Commission, and he, um, he was told uh, that his books were obscene. And he was asked if he didn't realize the connection between obscenity on the one hand and communist influence attempting to influence our youth to become degenerate juvenile delinquents. He didn't realize that this was a communist plot, although J. Edgar Hoover himself had said so. Ross said, well, if J. Edgar Hoover made a study of it, I think he'd come to a different conclusion. And um, the result of that, at least one of the results of it, was five years in prison for Roth. This was the clincher, a magazine in which Roth republished Beardsley's Venus and Tannhauser. The judge in this case, the, uh, the Justice Department attorney and the judge, uh, pointed to the fact that in this book, there was a small um, illustration, barely illustration, in which a, a, child's attend, a child attendant's penis was showing. The lawyer made the case that if you, the jury, allow this to go through the mails, I can assure you the sewers will open. Um, and uh, Roth, our Roth's lawyer allowed that to go through the jail through, uh, without objection, and Roth fired him almost immediately. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that several of these things, um, several of these uh, were um, very important in what Roth and uh, what um, Warner Ross said and Charles Rembar, his lawyer, were able to do, uh, were able to um, use in order to counter the uh, post office in 1959 when they uh, were allowed to send through the uh, Reader Subscription Book Club copies of Lady Chatterley's Lover through the mail. Thank you. Uh, so um, there's uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of history in my book. It um, spans 60, 70 years, so it's sort of hard to sum it up. But I think the 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 best frame um, um, in which to understand it is um, something I think bears on Grove Press as well, which is that 
um, it was a, um, Far Strauss and Giroux um, was uh, not uh, of the avant-garde as Grove was, um, but more importantly, it was of the rear guard when it came to uh, publishing trends. Um, it wasn't a canary in a coal mine, it was the last coal miner left standing. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, started in um, just after the war, it's probably the first publishing house started after the war by uh, Roger Strauss, a Guggenheim heir, uh, and a black sheep of his family um, who um, dropped out of a bunch of schools, um, as well as John Farrer, who is a uh, sort of old line publisher. And, um, you know, together they benefited from uh, post-war prosperity and the GI Bill. Um, but um, the tradition that they uh, sort of continued under w was the one um, that you could see from Bennett Cerf and uh, Alfred Knopf. Um, you know, you could call it gentleman's publishing. It's sort, sort of a hybrid of patronage and business. Um, and uh, somehow they managed to carry that tradition through an era of increased consolidation. Um, so what they served as, uh, as the years went on, was sort of a test case of, of how an independent publisher could survive and be self-sustaining, uh, not entirely funded by the uh, publisher who founded it, um, through the years um, and, and maintain its independence, which FSG did until 1994. Um, so, and the other thing is that, also in contrast to Grove, um, it, it, it never, it, it didn't have a single uh, aesthetic, a sing, single purpose. Um, it was editor-driven. Uh, Roger Strauss was not an editor. Um, he didn't necessarily have a literary point of view, but what he did was he hired extremely talented editors and he gave them free reign. Uh, so, uh, John Farrer, uh, you know, his taste led in the beginning, but what also helped, uh, at least from a literary perspective, was that um, these were uh, Cold War people. Roger uh, did PR in the Navy, had extensive contacts in intelligence, and in fact uh, relied on two scouts who were CIA agents, and probably reporting on the communist writers that FSG was, um, w was picking up in Italy at the time, which is uh, sort of ironic because they were benefiting these authors financially even as they were um, delivering the scuttlebutt on them to the uh, federal government. Um, but um, really it didn't cohere as a house with, um, with a literary reputation until uh, Robert Giroux came aboard in 1955. Um, he established his reputation at Harcourt Brace. He went to Columbia where he met John Berryman and Thomas Merton. Uh, through Berryman and others he got to know Robert Lowell and um, Gene Stafford and various other uh, various other authors, and at the same time, uh, Roger Strauss, by dint of his social connections um, and also his charisma, was able to meet some of these very same people. Um, and I just wanted to read um, just a, a, a paragraph about um, who these people were that they were meeting and um, that became FSG, the core of FSG uh, in the mid-century. Um, it was a loose conglomeration of writers, many published by Giroux, um, who made up mo New York's motley intellectual core. Old Southern agrarians like Alan Tate, Carolyn Gordon, and Peter Taylor, along with acolytes like L Randall Jurrell, uh, Dwight McDonald, Delmore Schwartz, Robert Lowell, Gene Stafford, and John Berryman, as well as mostly Jewish editors of the Partisan Review, which eagerly published their work. Edmund Wilson, Mary McCarthy, Hannah Arendt, and um, Alfred Kazin were some other key members. The critic Irving Howe theorized that what united these circles was their status as semi-outsiders. Uh, mostly Jews and Catholics and Confederates Manke on the fringes of time reading Protestant America. This is very important because um, FSG's relevance uh, pre-65 uh, had a lot to do with these movements. Um, the Catholic moment, um, which uh, is a term I think that Paul Eli at least popularized in his book about um, the mainly Catholic writers that Giroux mostly published. Um, and, and also um, it, it, these were uh, these were writers that Giroux, the Catholic, uh, avidly took on, um, and then also the Jews like Abraham Joshua Heschel, Heschel who was a um, who was a rabbi, as well as Isaac Singer, who they picked up via Noonday, a smaller imprint. Um, they be, they came to exemplify exactly this movement, um, and I wanted to read another paragraph uh, pertaining to that, which is. Um, uh, and this has to do with where they stood in publishing in general. In a field divided between Wasps, Doubleday, and Jews, Knopf, uh, you know, FS 
and Co. Uh, had one representative of each group, plus a Catholic for good measure. Uh, thanks to Giroux and Cudahy, who was the third partner before um, Giroux was named, uh, it already had a strong Catholic impression. Its 10th anniversary was celebrated in Catholic publications. It wasn't just Flannery O'Connor, Thomas Merton, and Vision Books. Um, there was a humanitarian Dr. Tom Dooley, Jesuit thinker John Lafarge. Um, the Catholic moment, um, I've just described that. Um, the sociologist Will Herberg, um, in his late 50s study, Protestant Catholic Jew, defined an era when American culture was growing more secular and more religiously identified at the same time. Religion, Herbert argued, was the true melting pot, boiling dozens of nationalities down into a few self-identified classes. Thus could the Irish and Italians come together under one distinct American identity. Thus could the Germanic Strausses embrace Yiddish stories and Eastern European mysticism as part of their culture. So it, what the Strausses, who, who were part of our crowd, this aristocratic Jewish crowd, um, were falling, they were falling in love with Isaac Singer. They became very good friends with him. What they were picking up from that was what Americans were picking up from these stories, these Catholic stories and these Jewish stories, which were allowing them to rediscover their heritage um, and become uh, fully American in Protestant America. Anyway, so um, bottom line, though, is that um, what, what Roger decided once uh, FSG had this distinct uh, sensibility and this literary reputation, uh, he looked around and he saw that Knopf had been sold to Random House, Random House was sold to RCA, um, that, um, that there was consolidation, uh, companies were going public, um, and he had to figure out how to position himself. And, and so this is what he wrote a scout to explain why he wasn't, um, why he was firing him so he could pick up, um, so he could spend money on other things. Um, this is in 1964. Um, in short, we must prepare, I feel, to take advantage of what is becoming more and more unique position in the American trade, i.e. the medium-sized independent, which is, as we both know, a rather attractive breeding ground and home for the truly creative artist. I do not believe that a number of first-rate writers now being published under the Random House Complex or some of the other non-independent publishers are going to stay there, and I'm hopeful that our house is going to look more and more attractive to that kind of writer. Um, he was right and he was wrong. Uh, one of the reasons he was wrong was that he failed to capitalize on the paperback revolution. Um, and uh, this was a time when you had to decide if you were a uh, paperback or hardcover house. And um, the people who decided how to publish quality paperbacks, Knopf, Knopf had Vintage, uh, Anchor, um, uh, Random House had Anchor. Um, this is something that FSG couldn't do. Um, so they stayed a paperback house, and to some extent, their business model continue to be antiquated. Um, but they continue to develop artistically, mainly by picking up uh, Henry Robbins, who is uh, Giroux's successor to editor-in-chief. Uh, he was um, this editor. They, they came over from Knopf, where he didn't have enough independence. Uh, he fell in love with new journalism. He got to know Joan Didion, her husband. Uh, they became such close friends that after Henry Robbins' death, uh, Joan Didion dedicated a book to him and titled it After Henry. Um, he uh, also picked up Tom Wolfe, uh, Donald Barlamy, uh, Grace Paley, and this is really, I think, if you're going to pinpoint uh, an, an era when uh, FSG was central to American culture, that was it. They were not publishing the rebels and the revolutionaries that, that Grove was. They were publishing re uh, reporting and um, novels that understood and got inside of those movements from a distance. Um, but uh, because of the economic realities that I mentioned, uh, Henry Robbins left um, for more money. Um, and things sort of went a little bit downhill from there. Um, and eventually, um, Roger found himself having more and more trouble competing with um, not only conglomerates, but agents who were starting to demand market rates for their writers. Um, and so we get to the downside of this whole model, this gentleman's publishing, which is that it's a sort of semi-feudal system that keeps writers dependent. And they paid all of Sontag's credit card bills, but they never paid her a decent advance. And um, she did say uh, later on, um, uh, you know, I was happy to be a poor intellectual in New York when everyone else was. But then when money came along in the 80s, everything changed. Um, and during one negotiation that he had with her, uh, which they wound up paying $800,000 for four books, which to Roger seemed unprecedented and obscene, he wrote in this letter how generous he was being to Susan Sontag. And I asked her son, David Reef, about this, and he said, I don't think it was generous at all. He thought it was generous. It was a very Roger word. 
what he was doing was paying market price for something, not getting a discount because he was Roger Strauss. And he thought he was entitled to a discount for being Roger Strauss and for FSG being FSG. Um, but the fact is, what allowed them to survive was actually this, um, this reputation that they had accrued. Um, and the fact that they continued to attract enough editorial talent to, um, you know, to pick up uh, Joseph Brodsky and Chesla Milos and, um, and Derek Walcott and all these writers who wound up winning Nobel Prizes in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so, it, you know, they, they uh, continued on, on economically because they managed to hold on to Tom Wolfe. And one of the reasons they held, held on to Tom Wolfe was that he had contracted for a novel in 1964 and it became Bonfire of the Vanities in 1987. Um, you're not going to find a lot of publishers that are going to wait for 23 years. Um, the right stuff was, uh, um, was in 13 catalogs over nine years. And it became a joke, an inside joke in the publishing world. Um, and then when it was published, everybody thought it was brilliant. Um, so these strategies, this long game, which being an independent allowed them to play, actually paid off. And I, I don't think that shareholder-driven publishing um, is able to make quite those kinds of investments. Now, FSG was sold in 1994, partly because Roger um, and his son couldn't get along, because Roger was Roger, um, an incredibly mm -hmm. egotistical, a uh, misogynistic pig who didn't let anybody um, have any power for themselves, um, but also partly because Raj wanted to make it a more commercial house. Um, so um, is FSG what it was um, now that it's not independent? Um, they uh, continue to have writers that they've spent years developing, um, Jeffrey Eugenides, Jonathan Franzen. Uh, they picked up Thomas Friedman's first book before uh, he became this uh, <coughs> massive middle brow figure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they, they have these writers and they managed to hold on to quality and because of Jonathan Galassi, who is um, Roger's successor and who actually has a very defined literary taste, which Roger never did, um, you know, they publish poetry, they maintain a commitment to it, but um, Jonathan Galassi is 62, 63, so you have to wonder what happens next. Uh, will it become another <laughs> imprint? If it becomes another Knopf, hey, great, Knopf does really well, they publish bestsellers, but is something lost there? Is what made FSG distinct from Knopf lost? It's something that remains to be seen, and probably a question that uh, if I could answer, um, um, I would. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I think that's about it. Um, I'm going to be a, a little bit more, uh, I guess, theoretical here tonight, um, partly because uh, um, this issue of personality publishing was something I had to engage directly with Grove. There are few publishing companies that are more intimately uh, and sort of completely associated with their founder and publisher than Grove Press. Um, and I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to write a biography of, of Barney Ross, that I wanted to write a history of Grove Press, but how to incorporate the um, how central this, um, uh, this company was to his sense of mission, to his tastes, um, to his sensibilities, was something that I felt, felt I had to engage um, from, uh, from the beginning. So what I'm going to do is sort of um, tease out the one uh, strand of, um, of my, the text where I deal with um, uh, really the interpersonal relations of the company, which is actually in some ways a subordinate part of this book. It used to be mostly about um, the, uh, the archives of the books that, uh, that people had published. Um, I sent an outline to Nat Sobel and he said it looked incredibly dry and boring. And I realized that was because he wanted me to write about him and them. Um, and so then I did interview a bunch of the, uh, of the folks um, and came up with a sort of way of contending with this. What I want to start with, though, I also wanted to make sure that um, I sort of give credit to the archives here. So I thought what I'd do is start out um, by reading from a document um, which Barney um, obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, there are innumerable reams of them here, and I did not get to look at all of them. And I should say that this one actually uh, was published. Um, this was uh, um, written up in 1943 when uh, Barney was in the Army. Military intelligence had gotten a hold of a, um, uh, an old Parker School friend of Barney to see whether um, he might not be a, a threat to national security out there in China, which he 
sort of was, but anyway. Um, here is what this informant uh, has to say about, uh, about Barney. Informant stated that subject has always been a person of mixed emotions, that his tendencies, beliefs, and ideals result solely from his extremely emotional makeup, and that the same are generally of a very temporary nature, something he will stake his life on this week he will have completely forgotten in the course of a month or two. Informant described the subject as being a headstrong individual, completely lacking in the spirit of compromise, refusing at all lengths to give up on his version of a particular issue. In fact, subject would energetically strive to convince all that his viewpoint was the only just and logical one. He remained always completely intolerant of another point of view. The informant then stated that the subject was very radical in his views, that his thoughts and ideals were definitely leftist in character. Subject was dissatisfied with the present organization of society and felt that the social organization that gives to people all the luxuries and comforts that he himself had enjoyed is a corrupt one and should not exist. The informant also stated that the subject totally lacks in sound judgment. He is incapable of appraising people. All of his impressions and judgments are based upon emotional reactions. The subject harbors and promotes thoughts and ideas concerning the reorganization of society. He actually does not know where he stands. He is almost continuously at loose ends emotionally. <laughs> Now, uh, exaggerated as, uh, as it is, um, there's a certain degree to which uh, all the people I interviewed sort of agreed with this appraisal. Um, Fred Jordan, Rossett's longtime colleague and managing editor at the Evergreen Review, called Rossett extraordinarily impulsive adding that the company was driven by Barney's moment-to-moment -moment impulses. Uh, Jeanette Seaver, widow of Grove executive editor Richard Seaver, agreed that Rossett was irrational, adding that he was also very generous. According to Herman Graf, who joined Grove as a salesman in the mid-60s, Rossett made most of his major decisions in seconds um, and then spent the rest of his life regretting them. <laughs> uh, purchasing Grove, however, would not be one of those decisions. Um, indeed, though Rossett developed a reputation for having uh, what one uh, writer called an iron whim, he in fact pursued his career in publishing with shrewd determination, and his instincts tended to be sound. He intuited... Um, that the obscure experimental dramatists whose work he acquired in the 1950s would become steady sellers once their reputations were established, and he realized early that the market for their printed work would be in the expanding university system. He sensed that the regime of censorship established under the Comstock Act was collapsing and that challenging it could therefore become profitable, and he saw the hypocrisies and contradictions of America's Cold War consensus in the 1950s and was therefore able to exploit the rise of student activism when that consensus began to unravel in the 60s. And possibly most important, he had exceptionally good instincts for finding other people who shared his vision and whose talent and expertise could help him realize it. So he was impuls impulsive, he was headstrong, he was opinionated, uh, but he also was a good judge of people and chose good people to work with him. Um, so when I interviewed these people, when I, when I brought, uh, I, I actually sent the first, one of the early chapters of um, my book, and I sent it to uh, Fred Jordan and Ken Jordan, his son. Uh, and Fred Jordan was really upset because I wrote about Grove as if it was a publishing company. <laughs> and he said, it wasn't a publishing company. Uh, and in fact, the people did not conceive of Grove as a business. Fred Jordan told me, if you take a publishing company to be a commercial enterprise, Grove never was. It wasn't a business, his son Ken told me. It was a project driven out of passion, which Barney completely self-identified with. So if Grove wasn't a business, what was it? This is part of my interview with them. Well, we just called it Grove because it was just its own thing, Ken replied. Jeanette Seaver had called it like a, a family. Maury Goldfisher, who had been in charge of promotion and publicity, had repeatedly used the term team. And now Nat Sobel told me that uh, Barney had told him that it was like a football team and he was the quarterback and he was calling the signals. So I, I like to picture him as you know, throwing long bombs and you know, calling all these weird plays. Um, I suggested what it, maybe it's a rock band um, and Ken said, well, it's more like a rock band than anything else. Um, but then he added, and this was key to my uh, eventual decision about how to treat this, the relationship was not so much from one person to another, it was one person to Barney, and then Barney to everybody else. And Nat Sobel had said the same thing. If we had any per personal relationship, it wasn't with each other, it was with Barney. So uh, the structure of Grove, as much as I was able to, to reconstruct it in my mind, was sort of like a wheel with spokes, right? That, that Barney was at the center, um, but that people tended to all uh, deal more centrally with him um, than with each other, than with each other. So, my interviews with Rossett's co-workers 
all of whom remembered him with a combination of affection and aggravation, led me to conclude that Grove, before Rossett decided to take the company public in 1967, was what the sociologist Max Weber calls a charismatic community, a small group of people who come together out of loyalty to a figure whose authority is based in his charismatic appeal. From 1960 to 1970, Grove Press was run not by Rossett alone, but by a cadre of men and women who are unwaveringly loyal to him even as he made decisions continuously that put the press economic economically at risk. Weber claims that charisma rejects as undignified all methodical rational acquisition, in fact, all rational economic conduct, and Rossett's impulsive decision-making style and reckless disregard for money perfectly illustrates this quality of the charismatic leader whose very irrationality is central to his appeal. Indeed, I got a lot of uh, flack from my colleagues, too, who wanted to be more, uh, wanted me to be more critical of Grove as a business, right? They wanted me to have a more sort of uh, um, Marxist line on, on what it meant that uh, ostensibly um, these people were profiting from revolution, profiting from uh, obscenity and whatever. And I, I realized that, um, that um, uh, figuring Barney, and, and who is enormously reckless with money, right? He spent enormous, uh, he wasn't uh, generous with uh, advances, by the way, uh, uh, Grove was probably even more, um, uh, had a reputation for being even more sort of tight-fisted with advances than um, uh, other companies. Um, but he was uh, reckless in terms of uh, putting money into the company um, and relatively um, uh, not unconcerned with profits, but that was not the, the, the central concern, right? So it seemed like this was really um, uh, um, uh, 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 an interesting model of this uh, community. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Weber, right, he, he, he formulated this theory in order to talk about religious communities, right, the rise of, of Protestantism um, and very, or the way in which uh, many religions start as cults around individual figures and then become institutionalized. Uh, but I found that this um, actually uh, is a theory of the development of institutions more generally. A lot of avant-garde communities uh, originate in this form where it's a, a cluster of people around, um, around one charismatic uh, individual. And then what eventually happens, right, is um, charismatic communities are uh, uh, tend to be unstable because there's no, there's no uh, uh, policy of succession, um, there's no uh, real organizational um, system besides loyalty to that one individual. So the, um, the, the, the charismatic community either has to become routinized uh, and um, become based in traditional uh, or um, uh, bureaucratic authority, right? Becomes big institutions, or it, it passes away. Um, so what this was, a what, what I was able to do then, uh, in terms of modeling it this way, was not only formulate uh, this as a, a structure of Grove's community around Barney's personality, but also put together what is sort of a decline and fall story, although I didn't really want to see it that way, of the incorporation of, uh, of Grove Press, right? So one of the key moments in the history as I write it is in 1967 um, when Barney decided to go public with the, with the company and it becomes a much larger um, corporation. Uh, it becomes much harder to run it in the way that he does and he no longer knows anyone in, everyone in the company as it, as it did, right? And it becomes um, uh, extremely chaotic and starts to uh, fall apart. So so um, anyway, this was my way of responding to the, uh, the sort of uh, standard take on, um, uh, on Grove Press, uh, which as one um, uh, article had said that it was a dynamic expression of Rossett's own personal likes and tastes in literature. Grove's editors are little more than extrasensory extensions of the master's personal literary tastes. Um, and so I wanted to somehow um, uh, modify or uh, um, complicate that, uh, that um, version, that understanding of what Grove was. So understanding Rossett as a charismatic leader and Grove as a charismatic community allows me to reframe this reductive and seductive interpretation and to understand Grove not as an expression of his personality, but as a community enabled by it. And, and the, the degree to the, the, the times in my book when I focus on the interpersonal relationships, focus on that. Um, I'm going to try and go quickly so we have some time for questions. I'll just say there is one, uh, I, foc I talk about it not just in terms of the aesthetic avant-garde, but also in terms of the political avant-garde, and there's a section here that focuses on Grove's revolutionary handbooks on um, uh, the Wretched of the Earth and the Autobiography of Malcolm X, and then there's one that maybe some of you remember. It was called Revolution in the Revolution by Regis Debray. Uh, it was um, a big deal when, uh, when Che was um, 
killed in Bolivia. Uh, Debray had also been there. He was jailed and uh, wrote this book, and uh, Grove did a, a big promotion about it as a handbook for revolution. Um, and uh, what, what Debray put forward in that book was the idea of the FOCO, right? the idea of the revolutionary FOCO, which is the small community of people. Here I can just quickly read the one um, quick part where he, uh, where he defines the, um, uh, the uh, the Foco, right? Uh, Debray says, Fidel Castro says simply that there is no revolution without a vanguard, that this vanguard is not necessarily the Marxist-Leninist party, and that those who want to make the revolution have the right and the duty to constitute themselves as a, uh, to constitute themselves as a vanguard independently of those parties. So revolution and the revolution provided both ideological license and practical guidance for such self-constitution. And I try and argue that uh, for some folks in the late 60s, working for Grove would have felt like joining a Foco. Right, uh, at this particular time in the late 60s when uh, there actually were people who thought that world revolution was, uh, was imminent, um, it wasn't like you were working for a publishing company making profit, it was like you were trying to come to New York to work for a sort of revolutionary um, collective. And, uh, so it was not just an aesthetic sort of grouping, it was also a... Um, a, uh, a political one. So this is then um, really forms the sort of nature of, of my conclusion around, uh, which focuses both on the incorporation as well as on the unionization effort and the feminist takeover of the press. And I'm just going to briefly read from this, the last chapter, and then um, we can open it up to, uh, to questions. Um, going public was a fateful decision and a transformative moment in Grove's history. Over the next few years, the company expanded exponentially as Rossett rapidly spent the profits made from I Am Curious Yellow on a variety of reckless ventures that brought the company to the edge of bankruptcy. In addition to indiscriminately investing in foreign avant-garde and pornographic film, Rossett in 1969 bought a massive seven-story, 40,000 square foot office building on the corner of Mercer and Bleecker and embarked on an ambitious series of architectural renovations, including an arched entranceway in the shape of the letter G and a private elevator for himself and the other senior editors. Grove was no longer a company, it was a corporation, albeit a counterculture cultural one. As the number of its employees rose, Rossett's relations to them became more distant and more strained. In an effort to maintain the charismatic community at the company's core, he had special hotlines installed in the offices of his senior staff that went directly to him. As Nat Sobel told me, we had what Barney called the hotline. This was in the late 60s when Barney didn't want to talk to anyone. Barney had already built an elevator so he could go to the office without seeing anybody. Only Fred and Dick were on that same floor. So in an essence, this is an attempt to maintain that sort of hub with the spokes structure when it's really no longer feasible with this enormous company, right? So as the company grew, the original tight-knit cadre of Rossett, Seaver, Jordan, Sobel, and Goldfisher began to disintegrate. Um, in particular, Sobel and Rossett fought frequently over Rossett's uh, reckless investment in film, and Sobel felt, which Sobel felt was distracting from the core mission of selling books. Um, I have a long section then where I talk about the, the breakup of the community, uh, particularly talking to, to Nat Sobel, who was um, still very emotional about it and told me he wished he had kept the phone so that he could you know, have it on his desk and say that phone will never ring again. Um, so as you can see, uh, in, in corporation um, is sort of the, uh, the inevitable um, fate of the, uh, of the charismatic community, right? I mean, I, I guess I could have subtitled my book The Institutionalization of the Avant-Garde, although neither, they're both clumsy terms which sort of flag the book as sort of clunkily academic and um, whatever, but that was the, uh, the sort of ambiguous legacy that, that I think Barney gave us is to legitimate, institutionalize the avant-garde, which is great, we can all publish it, we can read it, um, but it's lost its marginal risky status, right? It doesn't have the kind of appeal that it had when, uh, when Barney entered the industry. <coughs> We do have time for questions for any of our panelists. When Barney uh, did try to contact the Lawrence estate in 19, what is it, what, 54, 55? Yeah. What was actually the repercussions of the outcome of that? Was that they, weren't, they weren't happy with his idea of publishing the complete Lady Chatterley's America, were they? There was a, <coughs> uh, there's a mysterious, uh, there are mysterious gaps and absences in the what ended up being an almost five-year-long negotiation with Frida Lawrence. Um, my understanding, actually, from the uh, both from the correspondence I've read and from the various accounts of the story, which has been gone over many times, is that Frida Lawrence was amenable. It was Lawrence Pollinger, the agent, who was 
rigidly yeah. against this and felt that there was a copyright being held yeah. on Lady Chatterley's Lover. And then what happened is Frida died. Mm -hmm. And so once Frida died, Lawrence Pollinger took over the rights. And I don't know whether he hated Barney or just wanted to wanted to make sure that it went with Knopf, who had published the uh, expurgated version. Um, I think it was Knopf, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think I read something at Syracuse that said that that Heinemann was going, according to the estate, to publish all three editions, including the, ex the unexpurgated Lady Shirley right. Lover, in one book, but the time was not right, so forth. But it, if it weren't for Barney, it wouldn't have been decensored in, in 1960 in England. Well, my understanding is that what, what happened is after Frida died, um, Barney, uh, Barney's lawyers uh, actually discouraged him from, from going forward with it, mm -hmm. uh, both for copyright and mm -hmm. obscenity reasons. And I think he was mobilized by Rolf. I mean, after Roth the United States uh, passed, it was clear that um, there was a new loophole, a, a new mm -hmm. era. Um, Barney wrote to um, uh, Knopf, and uh, Knopf originally sort of demurred, uh, but then what happened is they sold their rights to uh, uh, Signet. New American Library. And then there were, uh, for a while, there were two competing, yeah. actually more than two, there were innumerable competing. But actually, Barney's, Barney's reputation was very much enhanced by this because he, the, the Publishers Weekly and the, 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 the community, publishing community, agreed that he should be granted the profits because he took the risk, mm -hmm. he took the initial risk. So it was a really, it wasn't just an important development in terms of obscenity, uh, it was a very uh, shrewd, Barney knew, Barney started with Lawrence deliberately, some of you probably know this, right, he wanted to publish Miller, uh, but he knew that people would be much more upset about Miller, so Lawrence was the opening wedge, he knew that Lawrence had a good reputation, um, he had, um, uh, what's his name, the, uh, the Lionel Trilling of the West Coast, um, who wrote the, who wrote the, uh, the introduction, the name is, um, uh, Slipping my mind, but I'll give it to you in a, um, a second. Who did? Who actually initiated the um, Mark Shore, yeah. right? Who wrote the introduction and did the whole um, uh, the deal? Yeah. There was a question. Um, I was going to ask you if you would go so far as to call Grove a cult. <laughs> um, I, I that would be strong, but I do. But I do think that I mean, and this was my impression from talking to people that Barney garnered enormous loyalty, even though he could be unbearable, right? I mean, he, he, would, he could be very um, irrational. He, he could fire and hire people and uh, whatever. Um, it wasn't like a cult in the sense of drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, I mean, I think that people, you know, you could lose a job at Grove and not feel like your life was over or, you know what I mean? Like people, um, but it was a, it was a, um, it was more, it was based on this kind of loyalty, which, uh, which, made, which made me think about it that way. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, I wouldn't go so far as that. I, I think, I mean, in 1965, I decided I wanted to work at Grove Press. <laughs> and, uh, and part of it had to do with the fact that I was, my, my unemployment insurance was, was running out and I had to get a job. <laughs> the one time in my life, I actually thought about it where I would like to work as opposed to getting a job. Right. And I wanted to work at Grove Press because Grove Press had the courage to publish a lot of books that nobody else would touch. And they weren't all bad books. They were good books. And so I called Grove Press up on a Monday morning and said to I was looking for a job, and I, you know, I had experience as a male folk. And then I spoke to this Harry Braverman, oh, yeah. who said to me, well, uh, we don't happen to have any openings right now, but if you'd like to come in and fill out an application, you know, we keep it on file. And I went there on set on Wednesday. And as it turned out, on Tuesday, the male clerk had quit. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a job opening. And I had these fantasies about sitting on the same toilet as William Burroughs. And, <laughs> and, uh, you probably did. Back in, you know, <laughs> and maybe even, you know, of course, it didn't happen because they probably didn't use those toilets. <laughs> in fact, I would say for the first few months, I would try to use the toilet on the floor that the editorial, editorial <laughs> bar was on. But 
I heard Ginsburg hung around there. It was, it was, it was very much a sense of community there. It was like a, a family. There were maybe 28 or 30 employees, and everybody knew everybody else. And it was very informal. And while I was working there, Rove was planned, was working, was on publishing My Secret Life. Uh, and they had started a book club. Actually, they had bought some six little book club. Myron Spurgeon and the Evergreen Club. club. And they offered My Secret Life package with a book called The Other Victorians by Stephen Marcus, which I read. And that book got me very interested in Victorian pornography. Wow, so that was how you got started. Yes, that's how I, got, that's how I became a pornographer. <laughs> and I, I, I used to go to all the, book, all the second-hand bookstores in that neighborhood. Right. Because it was grown as an eight-university place in front of Eleventh Street. And starting a block west, a block east, were the second-hand bookstores uh, on Broadway and uh, the Fourth Avenue. So there were also a couple on the university place. And I used to go into them every day. I would take more lunch hours. <laughs> and I started buying books about the history of pornography. And occasionally, you could find a piece of erotic in one of these stories. And I would buy it. Because I didn't know what I was doing, but I would. And I subsequently got fired <laughs> because of, uh, well, there were two things. First of all, I was never very, very diplomatic about, about my job. And I went to, was going to book in college. So sometimes one of the secretaries would bring something down at 3.30 or 4 p.m. and she wanted, you know, a mimeograph, and they couldn't do it. I had to leave at 5 o'clock to go to school. And I would say, I can't do this. And they didn't want to hear it. And Harry Brazen called me up to his office, and he said, I'm gonna, I want to speak to you like a fresh uncle. <laughs> and he said, no, you can't, you can't uh, speak to these secretaries though. I can't tell them that. Well, I'm just being honest. I'm telling the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling anybody to drop dead or go to hell. You know, I just said, I can't do it. I can't be done. But uh, what happened was, on one Friday, Barney had gone to the Hamptons and needed a pair of glasses that were at his opticians. So I went down to uh, to get them. And I was instructed to send them via first class special delivery to a post office box. But that was his address in, in uh, I guess, East Hampton, or whatever the other place. I think it was East Hampton. And I thought to myself, there's no such thing as special delivery to a post office box. <laughs> so I only sent them first class, and of course, they didn't arrive. I don't know if they would arrive by special delivery, but I didn't do it. And the Monday morning I came in, and I was delivering the mail, and I went to Barney's office, and the secretary, Judith, was on the phone, and Barney was screaming here <laughs> about me. And he kept saying, fire him, fire him, <laughs> fire him. And uh, I didn't get fired, but uh, I was eventually demoted to the warehouse and left the company. And several years later, I came back to sell erotica to grow for reprint. And Your name is throughout the archives. Like I said, I thought you were a bookstore. JB runs. No, I wasn't a bookstore. <laughs> I was part of the first. Actually, I'm, on, I'm, a, I'm a model on the cover of one of those novels. It's <laughs> <laughs> called so The Story of Seven Maidens. And uh, I'm with, it's an it's, it's, it's it's Edwardian novel that's kind of seen you know, about flagellation or something. This and was I'm, through the, uh, the Evergreen Club. Uh, Benny Zimmerman, who was at that time the uh, salesman, I'm embracing his, uh, his secretary, who was black, and I've got a whip around my neck. Those were the days. Uh, Sean, you had a question? Uh, yes, I, <clears throat> I guess I'm, this is a question for each of you. Uh, each of you. Um, to what extent uh, were each of these personalities kind of aware of the others? Yeah. And, 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 in what way did that help to sort of perhaps define or locate other folks? I don't know if I have an answer to that. I mean, I think I think New Directions 
was a, a more direct competitor just mm -hmm. because even though they were, I think I get the impression, smaller, mm -hmm. um, they were competing over many of the same poets. Um, and in fact, they published um, some of the young poets in the Younger Poets series and, and, and you know, uh, Giroux was trying to re rest Berryman away from, from them. Um, I mean, as far as Barney, um, I just think that Roger was so, um, and, and Giroux were actually quite conservative. Uh, I, mean, if, if, I think that the goings on in the office were smuttier than the, the, anything that was published in the books. <laughs> um, I, I, but I, that's a really good question. I mean, did Barney... Um... So I, I didn't see... First of all, there's very little correspondence with any of the up Midtown publishers uh, in the Grove Press uh, archives that I was able to find. Um, I do know that uh, Barney despised Knopf um, and actually really didn't like the folks who he saw as the more sort of uh, genteel Jewish publishers who had... Oh, Barney didn't see himself as Jewish either, by the way, which is a, but but the the publishers who sometimes he's seen as an heir of, right, the, the Knopf and uh, Horace Livright and those folks, um, even those folks, I think he saw as um, uh, more genteel and traditional kinds of folks than him. So I don't know whether he had a specific thing about FSG, um, but I think the the whole publishing, um, the New York publishing world was seen as this separate. Group that was in, you know, that was that was farther up the. Uh, and Roger the was resentful of Knopf too. Maybe right. Knopf was the uh, that led right. that charismatic community. Right, that's that's interesting. Um, Roth, I'm sure Barney knew of because uh, simply because of the law, if nothing else. Um, uh, but I don't know if he knew him yeah, personally. Yeah, yeah, I, after Sam got out of prison in 1961, <coughs> he and Barney had lunch. Uh, of course, Barney was very interested in Roth because of all of Roth's uh, experiences and because of the Roth case, right, right. Uh, which was really the springboard for uh, Barney's uh, 1959 case. But when they had lunch, Sam Roth did not want to talk very much about publishing or about erotic publishing. He had just written this <coughs> long novel in prison, which was really his life's work, and that was to reconcile the Jews and the Christians <laughs> after 2,000 years. Um, of separation, and, and he imagined himself in this book as back <coughs> with Jesus in uh, the last ministry in Jerusalem. And Jesus, uh, in fact, had given Roth a mission. Two thousand years later, when you're born, this is what you're going to do. Uh, it's very strange, but in this book, it's very interesting because there's a lot of very interesting ascetic uh, philosophy and uh, and legend in the book. And Jesus is described, of course, as you'd imagine, and many other writers, especially Sholomash, did this also, as a Jew with a Jewish sensibility to the core. So Roth wanted everyone to know this, and to found the society, so he, he, he decided to have a talk in Times Square. And he actually had the um, streamers in the subway, you know, the things that the strap hangers look at, the, the legends and the advertisements on top of where the ceiling is. They call them streamers about this talk he was going to give in Times Square. Um, and I don't know if it ever happened, but he was completely absorbed in this. And he took it very seriously himself. But he talked just about that kind of mysticism. And, so he, and Barney didn't get much out of him um, when he met him. But he really was oddly serious in a sense throughout his whole life. And this was his mission in life, despite the fact that he made his living through pornography. But as he put it in My Friend Yeshua, that's the name of this book, which is a Jewish name for Jesus, Jesus told him, I know that you would find yourself in jail for the wrong reasons, and this would give you the knowledge and the perseverance you needed for your life task of reconciling the Jewish and the Christian religions. You saw things from the bottom up. Now that didn't, that wasn't a uh, Erotic reference, by the way. <laughs> um, it's true, and it's very strange, but he's a very interesting man, a very uh, and a very learned man in his own way, especially learned about a Hasidism, which of course he grew up with. Barney was close with Jason Epstein, um, who eventually actually uh, interceded with Bennett Cerf to uh, help rescue Grove in the in the seventies. So he did he did have connections with uh, some of the Midtown publishers, but not but not as you. I think we have time for just one more question before breaking for the reception. Maybe. I'm just curious who, if anyone, do you all think 
think are publishing either revolutionary or avant-garde kind of books today? Mm -hmm. I mean, you always get that question. Um, you know, I mean, Grove under Morgan and Pinterkin is trying to keep up the reputation that Grove had of publishing edgy stuff, of uh, publishing um, emergent international kind of avant-garde stuff. Um, in addition to, uh, he loves historical novels, apparently, so he's also that. Um, and uh, and people, I, I have to say, I get this question almost every time I talk about this, and my, my sense is that you... People are still publishing the avant-garde, but the avant-garde doesn't mean what it used to mean, I guess is, is more of my sense. So there's, there's radical writers, um, uh, but I don't think they, they have the kind of purchase on our culture that someone like Beckett or Fennell would have had during that time. Um, so uh, now, uh, the incorporation of publishing has... Um, squeezed out a lot of the, these mid-range independent houses, like uh, as, as Boris was saying, um, although Grove remains independent. I mean, uh, Entrican has managed uh, to maintain it in the, in the, in the, the form that, that it is, although mo for the most part now, I, my understanding is it's a handful of huge conglomerates and then are just scattering over the world of, of tiny publishers, right? No longer even based in New York or just, just all over. Um, and a lot of them publish... Uh, very radical, edgy stuff. It's small print runs. It's niche communities. You know, it's not. That's the other thing is that uh, Grove, Grove, caught in with the counterculture, and that was a large group, but that was a large cohort. Um, and uh, now um, uh, it's more niche cohorts. You know, people read queer radical stuff, and there's that small group of people who do that. Or there's, but it's not. It's the. It's. I think it's the larger structure that's changed, as opposed to the actual. Because um, some people get upset that you know they're like, well, they're still an avant garde, and they're not like that. There's something quietistic about this this story. But uh, um, people publish things that they call avant garde, but it doesn't have the same purchase on, on our culture. I have a list of these. Yeah, that's right. People. It was a, a remarkable uh, list. Kind of, of course, the print runs are very small, but, uh, but and it's a small, it's an in group of various sorts. But some of the best radical, uh, I think, and even our uh, anarchist writing, as well as nonfiction. Uh, for instance, Feral House, which uh, publishes mostly nonfiction, but they'll publish far left and far right material of all sorts. Um, Rhino Cirrus, with E R O S being the last word, the last four uh, letters, uh, publishes some excellent writers, not only horror writers, but writers in the horror genre and in the, um, the noir genre, um, and in the anarchist genre. Mark, Mark Michael Perkins, I think, is one of, wrote a book quite a number of years ago called Evil Companions, which I think is the best um, anarchist novel, and it was written to write at the height of the Vietnam War, and its introduction is by Sandra Delaney. Um, Black Jackal, that's a British house. Um, there's a noir crime writer, Richard Godwin, who writes for them, also an anarchist. Um, high Risk, have you heard of High Risk? High Risk. Autonomy Media. Is yeah, Autonomy uh, Media, that's the other one. Um, and uh, I think your house is great, uh, and it, it has some very interesting stuff by a writer who writes about uh, Weimar Berlin in the 20s and 30s and writes about some of the most interesting people you'd ever want to meet who were uh, performers there. And of course, uh, he had at least two or three writers write about that, but uh, there's a lot of other stuff he writes about too. Um, I mean, he, he, uh, he publishes also, it's mostly nonfiction. Um, I think High Risk is uh, on high risk yeah, too. Nice. Those are two of his uh, collections of, um, of we, these are uh, these are uh, collections of a fiction by Feral House. Um, there are, and they're out there, and they're just simmering, in my opinion, because when you have um, um, war going on for as long as this war is, when you have a crash like we've had, you have what's happening. There's all stuff, all kinds of stuff out there, and I guess I forgot. But he's really published by large, um, by large public accounts. This is um, the great writer on the on the Vietnam War. I mean, you know who I mean. The things they carried. Oh, uh, you know to the right. I mean? Yeah, yeah uh, that, that's a bigger publisher, of course, but it's the same genre. It's, I mean, it's the same uh, uh, set of ideas, and it's really great to look at this stuff. We can take the discussion into the... Uh, yeah, into the well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much.